Welcome back, everyone. Our, our next session here for our, our Summit in Trade show is our annual Health Current update. Um, for today's session, uh, I'm joined by two additional presenters. Um, first, we have Keith Parker, who is our Chief Information Officer at Health Current. You've probably seen Keith present at these uh, sessions uh, in prior years. He's going to give us a technical update on everything that's going on at Health Current. And then um, after uh, Keith's presentation, I'll also be, uh, we will be rejoined by Morgan Honey, who is the CEO of Coreo. Given our exciting recent announcement about the um, intent to merge Health Current and Coreo as we look to expand in the Western region and, and form a, a regional health information exchange, Morgan's gonna join us towards the end of the presentation and share his, um, his thoughts and comments on, on that exciting development. So um, really, I'm gonna get started with the first part of the presentation here as we have done in, in previous years. So our health current update for the agenda for today's session, I'm gonna start by, for anyone who's on the phone who's less familiar with health current, just a few update slides about the basics of health information exchange. I actually did look at our um, presentation from last year, and in the past we've had uh, much more robust HIE basics, and, and I just know from looking at the registration list that many of you are have worked with us over the years and are familiar with what we do, so we're going to keep that short. Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about our 2020 to 2022 strategic business plan and what we've accomplished there, uh, give an update on our community support in the pandemic, and then wrap up with other key priorities and the future of the HIE. At that point, Point, I'll turn it over to Keith, who's going to talk about uh, the technology to meet Arizona's needs. And then Morgan is going to wrap us up with the future of HIE, Colorado's approach and regionalization. So um, as we go forward, just a reminder again, if you've got questions or comments, we would welcome those. It's, it's really great to have uh, questions from the audience during the Q&A portion, and we will leave hopefully 10 to 15 minutes at the end for any questions you may have. So enter those in as we go. So with respect to HIE basics, this is one of our most basic uh, diagrams that we use in presentations, is really demonstrating the high level concept of health information exchange. Health information exchange is the secure and private sharing of uh, health related information uh, among authorized individuals and organizations, you know, for purposes of a variety of, of uses as allowed by federal state um, laws and regulations. Um, so it is typically bi-directional exchange between all different types of healthcare stakeholders. You'll see just some of those examples here, behavioral health, medical providers, hospitals, and labs. But when you look at the full spectrum of organizations that we serve, you can really see that it's much broader than just those four types. So we serve everything from long-term care to accountable care organizations, behavioral health, state and local government, which we'll talk about significantly here in the aspect of the pandemic, emergency medical services, labs, imaging centers, rural health clinics, as well as obviously uh, the longtime participants in the HIE, which are the hospitals and the health plans um, and the health systems throughout our state. Um, we, we serve all types of healthcare providers, community providers being primary care specialty, and we really just continue to grow. So I mentioned earlier today, we have over 780. That's because we've got about 15, um, 15 to 18 agreements that are waiting to be signed, which will uh, momentarily pop up this number above that 780 number. And, and this has really been our growth trajectory. Uh, we've grown between 125 and 150 organizations each year on average. You can see we were in the mid 70s in 2015 and we've crossed that tenfold um, growth pattern um, be even before the end of 2020. So those are some of the basics about Health Current. I think many of you are familiar with the types of services we provide. The services we provide continue to expand and about every three years, we really look to identify as an organization what our strategic priorities are for the next three years. So last year when we were at the summit, it was about mid-November last year that we had our annual conference um, and we hadn't finished our strategic plan at that point. 
So we have presented on this a number of times, um, but I've only got a few slides in this presentation for anybody who's not familiar. This is what we call our four pillars of success. Um, really having that foundation of data and technology and trust. This, we adjusted this slightly in our 2020 to 2022 strategic plan. It used to be a core HIE uh, foundation. And we really wanted to articulate that that foundation is the, the real intersection, the combination of data plus technology, plus the trust of the community that, that creates that foundation upon which a successful HIE can be built. Um, data integration, data acquisition, data quality have been part of these four pillars. And, and previously we had that fourth pillar was called value added services. Well, for the 2020 to 2022 strategic business plan, we really acknowledge that any value added service we offer should really span all of these pillars. So instead of, uh, we changed that fourth pillar to be data management, because really it is our role as the data trustee for Arizona to be managing the community's data on behalf of the community and really doing the things that's necessary, um, both related to data quality and just normal data management to ensure um, that the, the data is uh, handled appropriately, that it is accessible. And of course, all of that leads to that roof of sustainability. So what, what happens when we did the strategic plan, because I'm not going through the nitty gritty today, is that we had lots of results. We, I already explained the four pillars of success. We articulated in the strategic plan five key findings. We articulated eight success factors. Um, even on top of all the new things we wanted to work on, there were six continued areas of focus that we needed to keep efforts going to continue to focus on areas that were important to our organization. And then we got to what we call our roadmap. And, and really, these are all the opportunities that we have to um, really look forward and look ahead and continue to support the organization. And we had so many, we had over 70 total opportunities to advance further in support of the community that we had to develop them into, uh, categorize them into opportunity categories. So if you are interested on our website, you can go under the about us section. There's a whole uh, segment on the strategic plan. You can download more detailed resources, but we do have those nine opportunity categories. There are seven, um, over 70 opportunities that we look to pursue in that three year span. And we really structured it as a roadmap. And, and in each category with each set of opportunities, we either said an opportunity was on the road, on the ramp, or in the parking lot. If something was on the road, it means that we believe we should address it and either complete it, initiate work on it, or initiate work on it and complete it within the three years of the plan. If something was on the ramp, there was some level of interest in it, um, but we really weren't sure uh, maybe there were questions about, is there enough interest from the community to pursue it? Do we have the necessary funding? Do we know all the details of what's needed and that we could actually um, take on that scope of work? There was enough open questions that, that we weren't sure if uh, it was something that would come up to the highest priority of being on the road. So those are other things we need to consider, the items that are on the ramp. And then things that were put into the parking lot or things that we didn't expect to address in the first three years. We realize they are important, so we want the community to know we are considering them for the future, um, but we weren't, we really didn't think that we could get to them in the 2020 to 2022 standpoint. Now, for some perspective, we rolled out and got our board to approve our strategic plan in January. We rolled it out to the community in February, and a global pandemic was declared in March. So obviously, uh, the bet, you know what happens to the best laid plans. Um, we had to be flexible as an organization. I would say that even in the context of the pandemic, we are continuing to focus on a number of the key areas. But once we got through the initial response to the pandemic and getting COVID alerts set up, we really had to take a step back and look at the strategic plan and say, what can stay on track? What needs to be delayed and what needs to be postponed? However, there were some really key focus areas that we had for 2020. And a few of them got delayed a bit at the beginning of the pandemic, but they really have continued in earnest because if nothing else, the pandemic has, has certainly, as Dr. Rucker was alluding to earlier, there are some things where if we had gotten them accomplished a couple years ago, 
we would be in a different position today, even in responding to the pandemic. And I would say that we were in a very good, we have been in a very good place in order to support the community, but there's still more to do. So advanced directives registry and the social determinants of health closed loop referral system still are key priorities for the organization. They are moving forward. I'm not gonna to spend too much time talking about them in this session because there actually are specific sessions at the summit that are um, going to give you more robust updates on those efforts. We've also gone live with an opioid treatment program central registry in collaboration with uh, opioid treatment programs across the state. We have finalized uh, some pilots around some super utilizer alerts. And really now we are focusing a lot of attention obviously on COVID-19 support and on support for public health IT infrastructure. So I'm gonna spend the next section of the presentation giving you an update of what we've been doing in the pandemic, just to give you a sense of those activities. So I divide the work that we've done in the COVID-19 arena into two buckets. Um, what we have done to support the healthcare community and what we've done to support the public health system. Obviously they go hand in hand, um, but you can distinguish uh, the different types of support we've provided to both. The underlying underpinning of this obviously is that real-time data has been proven critical for public health and community, um, the community's healthcare response. And we had a fantastic foundation in place. Sure, it would have been great to have the advanced directives registry in place or the social determinants of health system in place, but we had a tremendous foundation of data. We had a tremendous amount of real-time information flowing into the system, and we were able to react immediately. So for the healthcare community support, that reacting immediately occurred within a number of weeks. Within two weeks of the pandemic being declared, we actually had COVID-19 alerts live. Those were real-time notices to healthcare providers if their patient had COVID-19 tests, either positive or negative. Um, and today over 200 organizations receive COVID-19 alerts and related support. We provide regular COVID reports to both access and to all the Medicaid health plans. And we actually also um, are continue to explore how we can support um, the Navajo Nation um, and I, I would note that, you know, this is where some of the challenges have come up that I referenced in the presentation with Dr. Rucker, that not all COVID-19 test results flow to the HIE. So we continue to work with the lab community, with public, uh, the Arizona Department of Health Services and with the community at large to make sure we can get as much data flowing to the HIE as possible. went forward one too far. On the public health side, we actually um, do a number of things and the list of what we're working on with uh, ADHS and public health, uh, county and other public health entities is growing. So we provide the Arizona Department of Health Services with HIE portal access for syndromic surveillance. We did that very early on. Uh, there are some provisions in some of the public health emergency declarations from the governor that allow broader access than may be accessible under normal circumstances. We provide weekly data reports on COVID positive patients to ADHS. That actually allows um, them to close the gap on information that they may not otherwise have related to comorbidities, hospitalization data, um, race and ethnicity, uh, and, and just giving uh, broader access to medical records so that as Dr. Rucker said, you don't know exactly the data you need. So having that utility function in place is helpful. Um, Real-time data from hospitals this summer and, and late last spring, we worked with the hospitals and um, with ADHS to report real-time bed capacity information to the surge line for bed management during peak time. We have labs connected to the HIE uh, that actually we are now reporting their information through the ADHS. So ADHS for electronic lab reporting purposes gets that information in real time. And then in addition, we get that lab data to be able to alert out to providers. Um, we, are, we have actually applied for federal grants and I'm happy to report um, that we actually received one in the last couple of weeks. Um, so we've actually uh, received a grant to support hospital reporting for state and federal purposes 
So if you are a hospital or a health system, we will be sharing more information with you in the coming weeks on that. Um, and, and there's even a number of other things we're doing with public health that I've got on some subsequent slides here. So we really want to continue to align and leverage that community IT foundation. Um, we have, have had some additional wins in this area, but of course there is continued need for collaboration and advancement so that when, as we continue to progress throughout the pandemic and even beyond into that recovery period, we make sure that we have the right systems in place so that the information can get out, get to public health, um, but not only to public health, also to the healthcare community. We are looking at opportunities to support immunization data um, once the COVID-19 vaccine is available and even in this um, influenza season and, and in the flu environment. For those of you who may be uh, Medicaid providers, we actually do host a page on our website at the request of all of the access health plans because we work so closely with them, they asked Health Current to host a web page to house all of the Health Plan COVID-19 updates in one place. And that is live on our site and we continue to update that as needed. And, and Morgan may speak to this a little bit more um, during his presentation, but one of the exciting things, um, and Dr. Rucker alluded to this because we've been fortunate to be able to collaborate with ONC in a number of these areas, um, we actually are collaborating with five other health information exchanges. You can see those represented here from Maryland, Indiana, Nebraska, Colorado, and California. And this is a COVID-19 dashboard that we actually stood up in literally three weeks. And we were able to demonstrate this to federal officials, not because it was difficult to stand up the dashboard, but there is really a lot of power in the data that health information exchanges have and putting a dashboard together was easy as long as that hard work and underpinning of making the connections over many years with many data sources is already in place. So we have this multi-state dashboard um, that we update regularly. We're actually looking to transition it to be uh, more real time, but it was really developed as a proof of concept to show um, with a small group of HIEs um, we're looking to expand it to other HIEs now, uh, actually, is, is what is possible when that information exists in, that, in, in a health information exchange. So you can see there are 5 million individuals tested between um, February and September. And, and every time we rerun this data, it's actually the Correo team that actually hosts this. So this is one additional thing that we can look forward to um, from the Arizona side as we move forward in our merger activities with Colorado. So just a few additional things on the public health side. Um, we created this diagram really to demonstrate in, in one of our federal grant applications, um, the work that we have been doing and how those connections on the left side with representative types of healthcare providers that have are the point of care and are collecting all of this data. When it comes to the HIE, you can use it both to flow information back to providers, but also to flow it through to a variety of different Department of Health Services or public health um, systems, uh, databases, registries, et cetera. So um, actually the representation here is that one of the things we have, we are receiving some funding to do, and we will have more information in the coming weeks, is that hospitals are actually manually reporting a slew of information to the EM resource system within the Department of Health Services. Um, and, and as Dr. Rucker alluded to, and having a public health background, I, I fully agree and support that public health needs this information. Um, and so what we have done is partnered with the Department of Health Services so that going forward, that, that manual reporting from the hospitals to EM resource is minimized. And as much as possible, we automate the, the reporting of that information through the health information exchange so that the, the HIE can receive it. It can go through to the Department of Health Services for the purposes it's needed for with respect to uh, the public health response. And then it's also available in the HIE for a variety of different purposes. Our colleagues in Maryland at the HIE there called CRISP 
um, actually have a series of dashboards that they make available to their participants as well as to public health, which goes again to leveraging data for multiple purposes to assist the community as a whole. So as we go forward, you will see there are four different systems that have been initiated just in the pandemic. Prior to the pandemic, the ACES immunization registry connection between the HIE was complete and this AZ peers down here at the bottom. But since the pandemic happened, we have actually tripled the number of systems or we will be tripling the number of systems we are connected to at ADHS. We have a connection now to the electronic lab reporting system for uh, lab reporting or ELR. I, I mentioned the connection that we have to Central Logic, which is the system that supports the Arizona surge line. And then through a series of new projects, um, again, if you're a hospital or health system, we'll be in touch with you because there's opportunities to work together on this. We actually will be receiving funding to support actually facilitating these connections as described on this um, slide to the EM resource system. And as a side note, that system is also working to, and I believe is already connected to federal reporting systems. So by this one connection, you can actually, if you desire to check both the federal, the state reporting and the federal reporting requirements in one fell swoop. And then we are also about to initiate with uh, Department of Health Services, another project related to electronic case reporting and utilizing some of the COVID related funding to advance uh, those activities as well. So the good news and the opportunities is that we continue to be responsive to our participants' needs. Um, we have had a lot of positive feedback from the community. Um, we appreciate feedback, positive, negative, or otherwise. Um, and we have those alerts live and with 200 organizations. And ultimately, I think the Arizona healthcare community is getting most of the data that's needed to respond to uh, the pandemic and the value of HIE as, as noted by Dr. Rucker is being highlighted nationwide. The opportunities are, we obviously would love to have more lab data. Um, we're still having challenges with receiving some complete lab data, but we'll continue to pursue that. Complete data is always the key. Um, data gaps do need to be closed, so filling the gaps in the future will be key. And we hope that there will be more funding allocated, um, certainly to public health IT infrastructure, um, as well as utilizing the foundations that we've built together to leverage federal investments. You can see here that we continue to have a variety of stakeholders that have provided um, testimonials to the support that, that COVID services uh, from Health Current has provided to them. And we continue to highlight um, uh, their feedback and really appreciate the community's uh, support and interest. And then the last few things before uh, we move forward and I turn it over to Keith, it's just a few other key priorities. Um, Dr. Rucker mentioned some of the different federal rules that came out that have come out last spring, right around the time that the pandemic was declared. Those were anticipated and expected. One of them in the CMS, patient access and interoperability rule has a new CMS condition of participation. It's called patient event notifications. And we've actually been working with the hospital and health system community to identify um, really what it is that uh, we need to know as a community that hospitals need to be aware of and how HIE can support that. So we have a white paper on our website. We also have um, discussed and had several sessions to talk directly with hospitals and health systems in roundtable discussions about the value added benefits of using HIE to meet conditions of participation. Um, uh, in hindsight, I probably should have asked Dr. Rucker a, a question about this, um, but uh, I know in talking with ONC, they are very supportive of uh, the structure that's already in place with HIE. As you can see in this diagram here, we have between 95 and 100 percent of ADTs from all hospitals in the state flowing to the, to the HIE, depending on what region you're in. Um, and those can be leveraged to make sure that, that those inbound ADTs from 97% um, of the inpatient and ED visits are, are utilized. It took 10 years of the community's efforts to, to grow Health Current to where it is today, um, and that was a significant investment. So we now need to utilize that to everybody's benefit to make sure uh, that we can connect everyone out to uh, for these new federal regulations. 
Other activities we have going on is the differential adjusted payment program. Um, if you're impacted by that, just please keep an eye on all the updates that we send out. There are different milestones. Dr. Recker, uh, I didn't even note this, he alluded to the importance of Medicaid incentivizing providers, where our, our Medicaid agency does incentivize providers for utilization of, of HIE technology. <clears throat> we are launching our HIE participant satisfaction survey, so keep an eye out for that. We always appreciate your feedback. Um, we've got the information blocking final rule coming down the pipeline. I do hope that there will be um, a delay announced on that, but we are prepared from the HIE standpoint. And we're happy to assist our community in, in whatever we can to provide you with the guidance needed um, to meet those regulations as well. And then we are working on several things to streamline the hospital reporting burden. Um, I, uh, we actually were awarded a federal grant um, from the Office of the National Coordinator that supports public health agencies in their effort to respond to public health emergencies by building upon HIE services. So we will be getting out more information on that grant in the coming weeks, as well as on the electronic case reporting project we will be initiating, but we really are looking um, to streamline hospital reporting burden, um, rep reporting efforts and actually reduce burden for hospitals and health systems. I mentioned this at the very beginning, but I couldn't get through an update without again um, uh, expressing excitement for the governor's proclamation of Arizona HIE Week this week uh, that really is celebrating the secure sharing of health data statewide. Um, I should have put a little screenshot in here. Uh, our team dug up the actual uh, article that was published when Governor Napolitano back in 2005 actually issued the executive order that started the ball rolling that then created the roadmap that created our organization. And here we are today um, really flourishing and advancing in this area 15 years later. And certainly we are also extremely excited to announce our plans and our intent to merge Health Current and CoRio. We are two very strong and mature HAEs in the Western region. And this is a strategic opportunity that we have been working on for a number of months. Um, I won't steal uh, Morgan's comments because he's going to speak a little bit more to this later on in the presentation. Um, but this really is uh, bringing together two very equal HIEs uh, to make an even stronger organization and offer more opportunities for our community going forward. So our board is very excited about this. Our team is very excited about it. And we will have more information coming soon. So with that, um, hopefully I kept it to my, my general time that was needed, but I'm going to turn it over to Keith Parker now, who is going to talk to us about the technical updates um, related to what we're working on at Health Current, which obviously is the underpinning of everything we do. So Keith, let me turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Melissa. And thank you for everybody joining us. It is very exciting to be part of Health Current uh, in this journey to be able to facilitate uh, the use and implementation of technology. All the ideas, all the things that Dr. Rucker, Melissa, and Morgan have spoken about have an underpinning of how do we actually deploy and use technology. So a couple things gonna be going over is lessons learned, because I think it's really important that we don't just uh, take an idea and move forward, but we learn from those ideas. We learn how we work with each other and how do we move forward from there. Gonna then talk briefly about our technology stack, our migration, a real quick update, and then just bottom line information. So it's a quicker kind of down and dirty update uh, for this year's summit. So lessons learned. First thing I want to draw your attention to is the bottom uh, three statements down there, and they're all the same, and they're the same for a reason. Data quality, data quality, data quality. If we don't have usable data, we cannot get it to the uh, into the system, store it appropriately, and make it usable to our end providers. This includes, from a data quality perspective, the implementation and use of federal standards that come out. Dr. Rucker spoke quite a bit about fire. That's on almost every one of our technology updates that we're looking at. Uh, US CDI, the use of APIs, all of this has to be agreed to and implemented in such a way to where it's usable across our technology stacks and across our healthcare spectrum. So I think it's extremely important to to outline or for me to bring that up. 
Also here in Arizona, we've done a lot of things around the data quality that Melissa mentioned with our differential adjusted uh, payment program and in collaboration with Medicaid and Access uh, is rolling out those data quality standards with our board and having core data sets. So I wanted to point that out. Other lessons learned. We made a conscious decision from a technology perspective to have local ownership in very specific areas uh, and to build up our own internal expertise in our IT staff. This gives us the ability to move quickly uh, and accurately to meet our uh, healthcare organization needs. This is one of the things that I think that I feel strongly put us in a position to be able to support some of the COVID-19, some of the pandemic needs that arose very quickly. And Health Current was on the leading edge of being able to meet our stakeholders' needs with the development of alerts, with the development of different reports to ADHS, with the development of the bed or real-time bed registry functionality. Uh, expanding, this goes hand in hand with expanding and developing local expertise. This puts us in a position where we're working together not separately and not in silos. Uh, for those of you that know me, know that I'm a very big system information. To be a system uh, individual or to approach it from a systems approach means that we all need to work collaboratively in how we uh, develop and put those standards in place. Listen, so big piece here is we do not operate at Health Current in a vacuum. We listen and collaborate with our stakeholders. What's the goal and the purpose and use of that data, right? current technical and future technical makeup, spending lots of resources on a technical infrastructure that you're planning on changing in the next number of months. We wanna know the ins and outs of how you're using your data and what stacks individuals are on. That's an extremely important lesson learned and it reduces uh, a waste in our resources that are very important for all of us. Timing, right? We all want everything real time, but we all do not need everything real time. When is it a report? When is it, is it an alert? When is it needed real time because I just presented at the ED? And when does it need to be a larger data set that needs to be incorporated into how you're looking at measures or quality uh, measures within your organizations? And lastly, uh, data format, right? What is the current platform you're on and what are the format? How does it take data in and how does it provide data back? All these are extremely important because at Health Current, we look at ourselves not just uh, as a data manager, but a technical facilitator, right? How do we bring the community together to be able to support all the standards and all the different technology stacks that are out there being used? Uh, next uh, slide, please. So really quick, this goes back to our lessons learned in our technology stack. This is a down and dirty. Uh, we made a conscious decision again to uh, flexible locally operated integration engine, okay? So what does this mean? This means that our integration engine, which is basically the doorway to all the data coming in and being shared is operated locally with our staff. We take pride in having that ownership. This is where uh, data quality starts. This is where API start. This is where that integration and standardization piece lives having control over those uh, staff and having those staff as part of our organization is an extremely important part as we move forward. That is done, again, as everybody knows, we do use a Mirth Connect stack. And again, that is uh, operated and really the ownership is on Health Current. Clinical data repository. Everybody knows that we moved on to a data repository or off our old Mirth and we're moving on to the Health Data Hub, which we affectionately refer to as HIE 3.0. We also chose this not uh, from just its perspective of moving forward, but moving forward and meeting uh, not this year's, not next year's, but the futures, the next quite a few years uh, standards and how they're developing. How does it actually move forward and support the use of fire? How does it support the use of APIs uh, and how we integrate from the integration engineer perspective? And then how does it also from number three, supporting appliances? How does it integrate with those different appliances? And I put the ability to increase appliances because as we move forward, we're going to add different software applications, different needs as we look at SDOH, as we look at ADR, as we look at different areas to where healthcare needs to expand. And as we expand, we also expand the different platforms that are being used in those market segments. 
Because the frustrating part being on the technology side is we all adhere to standards, our own standards. How do we adhere to those standards and expand them to be able to meet national standards and then collaborate across? So social determinants of health have very specific areas. ADR has very specific areas. A lot of our healthcare, whether you're on HL7V2 or you've already moved forward with FIRE, all have different standards and they're all applied slightly uh, with a slight variation. So it's extremely important that we have a platform that can meet current or past, current, and future standards as we're moving forward. Uh, next slide, please, Melissa. So really quick, our migration and performance update. So extremely exciting moving forward with our platform change. One, it gave us more control on our integration engine. Uh, that was part of our migration. Uh, a few areas that I wanna point out, we are live with our alerts. We were li went live with our alerts. Our very first one went live December 31st last year. Uh, we realized some issues, we've worked through those, and we've been scaling uh, throughout 2020. We actually use part of the HDH platform, or HIE 3.0, uh, in our support of our COVID response and being able to get out COVID alerts moving forward. We're also live with our query and response. These are the documents that we receive and that we make available to our end users. We're currently migrating all of our 42 CFR part two data and validating use cases. This is moving over all the data sources through our connection engine into our HIE 3.0 platform, as well as once that's complete, we will be migrating all the data over. It's anticipated that that'll be completed by the end of this year. We're also beginning portal validation to include uh, how we're going to transfer over the crisis summary elements of our behavioral health portal. We feel that it's extremely important that we work toward a, a system that's more inclusive rather than siloed. In the past, our system had to be siloed due to the fact that we had the part two information that couldn't be commingled in our current or the system that we're moving toward uh, does this through uh, a series of layers, but it puts everybody in the same pool. So very excited about that. A couple things that we've seen as we move forward is our uh, downtime is decreasing uh, almost monthly, which is extremely exciting. And our performance as far as how much data we can move through our system is also increasing as well. So we're hitting both ends of that spectrum. Our downtime is decreasing, but our performance and the amount of data that we're moving is increasing uh, as we're moving forward. The other piece, as Melissa shows those slides that we've gone from in 2015, 70 participants to uh, well over 700, we're starting to push the 800 uh, number. We've also significantly increased the data. So for those data geeks out there, we've gone from a terabyte to pushing 50 terabytes of usable clinical data. We've gone from hundreds of thousands of patient records to 12 million plus or minus patient records with approximately 10 million that have clinical information. And with the data quality as an underpinning, the amount of usable data is increasing on a regular basis as well. Next slide, please. So bottom line, data quality is improving, performance is improving, flexibility and accessibility is improving. Uh, this puts us in a fantastic position to be able to meet uh, CMS's final rule. This puts us in an excellent position to be able to meet some of the things coming out of 21st Century Cures Act, TEFCA, all those different uh, technology things that Dr. Rucker, Melissa, and Morgan speak about frequently. You have to have the stack in place and the technology in place to do it. And you have to start not weeks or months, but years out to be able to do that. Health Current in Arizona is in a fantastic position to be able to support uh, current and future needs moving forward. The other line item here that I want to point out as we're merging or moving, migrating to our HIE 3.0 platform, your account managers are reaching out to you. Please feel free to reach out and I would encourage all of you, if you haven't done so already, reach out to your account manager. Know where you're at within that migration uh, plan that we're setting up to get everybody moved over to the new platform and have a fully functioning, all of our services are running off the same environment, not dual environments as we move forward. 
So with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Melissa, and thank you all very much. Great, thank you so much, Keith. And we are for the final segment here, uh, we're gonna turn it over to Morgan, who's gonna speak to us about his perspective uh, related to the future of HIE, regionalization, Colorado's approach and more. Um, and I would just side note here for all of those, for all of you watching this presentation, please enter any comments or questions you have in the question box, because um, once Morgan wraps up, we will have uh, a little time for Q&A at the end. So Morgan, over to you. Thanks, Melissa. So uh, first off, I want to thank the entire Health Current team for uh, inviting me to participate today. Um, and really, uh, my, my portion of this presentation is going to be building on, on the use case and, and the purpose and the reason why uh, the announced intent to merge between Corio and Health Current is so important. Uh, but to start, I, I figured it would be helpful to, to kind of uh, do an apples to apples comparison and, and give you an idea of what the Corio network looks like. Um, so this is our standard uh, dashboard slide that we use to, to Melissa's point, show uh, the status of our HIE. Um, and, and it's ironic, uh, it is exactly a year ago today um, that Melissa was sitting up on the stage with Keith at, at last year's Health Current Summit, uh, providing this update. And I literally was texting Melissa during the presentation saying, Melissa, uh, our companies are, are eerily similar. And don't you think that there's a better way that we can be doing this work? Um, and so the conversation around, around uh, this relationship really started almost exactly a year ago today. Um, and it's taken us the last 12 months um, working together to understand each other's uh, organizations, our communities, um, to get to where we are and, and be able to make the announcement that you've seen. Um, so just real quickly, uh, to, to Keith's point, we have about 7.7 .7 million unique patients in our MPI. Uh, we have 70, 74 hospitals um, live inside our system, 12 different labs, um, 54,000 ambulatory care summaries that are added each month. Um, and we send out about 4.7 million notifications on our different products each month. Um, it's a tremendous amount of data that we move and, and we move that data for many of the same purposes as Health Current. Um, I, I believe that one of the driving forces um, between our merger um, discussion is uh, access to ubiquitous interoperability. And I believe that as you, as, as we go through this process together, uh, many of the things that you'll find is that Health Current and Corio uh, do, do and provide many of the same services, um, but there are also a number of services that are unique to each organization that we really would like to be able to extend um, to each of the communities that we serve both in Arizona and, and Colorado. Um, a couple of those that I would highlight from, from the Colorado side is we do have an incredibly deep relationship with public health. Uh, you heard Melissa talk a lot about the things that, that Health Current is doing um, in regards to response to the, uh, to the pandemic, um, expanded ELR capabilities. Uh, we, we do those things as well as others. Um, you heard me mention um, our program with the state of Colorado to provide um, master patient index support or, or what we call identif uh, identity management services to help state agencies understand who those folks are that they're serving through their different programs. That's been a, a tremendous success uh, for both us and the state of Colorado in helping co better coordinate care, not only in the healthcare sector, um, but also in the social services sector. We also have an extremely deep um, and vast relationship with the state Medicaid agency to support electronic clinical quality measures programs. Um, so unlike, uh, unlike Arizona, Co uh, Colorado is almost 100% fee for service. I know that the Medicaid program in Arizona is largely uh, capitated. Um, in Colorado, our Medicaid agency is looking to migrate to alternate, pay alternate payment methodologies uh, using ECQMs as the backbone uh, for supporting that, that migration. Um, at Corio, we're doing the vast majority of the support for ECQM, not only reporting, but also generating those, uh, those measures out of EMRs. Um, so going in and helping practices, not only ensure that their workflows are appropriate, that the data is getting where it needs to be inside their EMRs, but also in the validation process when those reports are generated, being able to integrate the HIE data to capture those things that may not be performed inside the walls of your clinic, and then get them back over to the Medicaid agency to support those APM programs. Um, another big one that we've got on the horizon um, that goes directly back to Dr. Rucker's presentation is all about um, 
meeting federal standards and, and emerging rules. So one of the things that uh, every state Medicaid agency across the country is going to be required to implement in the coming years is called the Blue Button Initiative. Um, and this is where really focused on not only patient access to health information, uh, but the integration of clinical and claims information for the Medicaid program in order to, um, to communicate back to their members. This is a huge lift. Um, it, it's, it's a significant undertaking for every Medicaid agency across the country. And in Colorado, Korea is working incredibly close with our Medicaid agency uh, to support that initiative. And those are just a few things that we hope that, um, that the folks in Arizona will be able to leverage that, that we've been able to build and, and support here in Colorado. Um, but there's also a number of other use cases, particularly for folks on the phone who may be operating uh, more in regional uh, approaches to healthcare, whether that's uh, large health systems, large health payers, uh, but also how can we leverage all of those unique propositions that uh, exist within our, our different territories or, or geographies um, that we could leverage to benefit one another. And um, I tell my team quite often, um, it, it doesn't seem like we uh, could get any busier, but we consistently do. Um, and the ability to bring our organizations together uh, to leverage the, the incredibly unique insights and, and knowledge that our staff have uh, to support one another on on a shared portfolio of services is incredibly exciting. And as we, um, as we enter into this next phase of our due diligence process uh, to become the largest HIE in the country, um, certainly the largest HIE in the West, um, it's an incredibly exciting proposition for our organizations and our communities to be able to leverage one another, all of our learnings, all of our expertise um, to create ubiquitous interoperability for healthcare providers in our communities. So Melissa, with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to you and thank you for having me today.